Hey guys, uh, my name's Matt. Just sharing uh, my journey to a tick under 19 months of sobriety from alcohol. Uh, I'd wanted to do this for a while, sort of put it off because I felt like I needed more credibility in relation to how long I've been sober uh, and just wanted to share this for people who might be a little bit confused about whether or not they have an addiction to alcohol, uh, whether they have a desire to be sober or are sober, uh, who have relapsed, it really doesn't matter. Um, I know maybe not so much in the last few months, but certainly uh, before that, and I will continue to find a real sense of um, empowerment and comfort in watching other people's uh, videos about being sober and also um, reading a lot too about um, you know people's memoirs or uh, autobiographies on their um, journey to sobriety and really heart-wrenching and, and incredibly uplifting uh, at the same time. I just wanted to give you my life story. Uh, I will say that I, I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. Uh, my mum and dad separated before I remember, so perhaps before the age of three. So I live with my mother and uh, two elder sisters. I have one brother who's severely autistic, so he's been in residential care, I think since about the age of eight. So essentially it was just myself, my two older sisters and my mother. Mum was a um, incredibly uh, dysfunctional, beautiful, artistic, passionate woman who his life was destroyed through addiction to uh, opiates, uh, heroin and prescription medication and, and alcohol uh, all on the same boat. Fast forward a bit, I was uh, thankfully taken out of her uh, custody at the age of nine, stayed in a foster home for a year and then my dad, who'd sort of been on and off the scene, took custody of myself and my second eldest sister, uh, whom I lived with uh, until I was 18 and moved out. My older sister, who copped the brunt of looking after two of her siblings, unfortunately went down the path of a pretty messed up drug addiction. Her saviour was falling pregnant at 16, having a child, and her life tr changed dramatically. I, I think her testimony would uh, just be absolutely incredible. I hope she does that one day. She's um, 40 now. Um, four beautiful kids and She's a registered nurse, just an amazing, inspiring woman. Uh, I had my first drink when I was 13. It was at my best mate's dad's 40th. I think I had half a bottle of Crown Lager beer, and that was it for me. I wasn't drunk, probably was tipsy, but didn't go any further that night. It was a bit of fun. And uh, sort of started drinking a little bit with my dad. He let me have a beer or two. Did that throughout my teens. Um, about 14 onwards. Then uh, sort of the the garden variety sort of stuff from there, mainly parties, sort of about year 10 onwards. I'm, I'm 34, so it was mainly late 90s, early 1000s. Um, when you'd hang out for a, a shindig or a party every sort of few weeks and pretty shy uh, reserve kids, so alcohol was my social lubricant that helped me to engage, particularly with girls, <laughs> without much success. Um, enjoyed drinking pretty sort of moderately sort of throughout my teens. Hit 18, had a bunch of mates and, you know, we'd go out every week, a few times a week and, and drink and that's when all the drunken shenanigans and pretty heavy drinking started for me. Um, curved it pretty well throughout my early 20s. I've sort of always been working and was in a serious relationship with a girl we moved out together when I was about 20 and I stayed together until I was 24 and she called it off and fast forward to that bit that was a it was 2010 in April and that was a beginning of a really really severe downward spiral I've lived with her since I was 18 I had no idea what I was doing in life I was absolutely destroyed by it uh, semi homeless there for a while still living with her mother, which was uh, absolute toxic wasteland. It's a beautiful woman, but I don't know why I was still there. I, I didn't know how to look after myself. I was terrified of the thought of living on my own. I ended up 
moving in with my sister's partner's parents and stayed there well past my welcome for about, um, oh, I think at least eight or nine months. I think they were hoping I'd be there for about four weeks. So found a sort of organic Christian community group and they had houses. They put me up in a house and uh, I loved it, you know, a bit of fun, some good blokes. Um, all pretty shady sort of fellas, even though he pretended to be Christian, a mate that was a heroin addict, and I'd uh, drink away in my room, and, you know, we had a, a house leader, he didn't live with us, but he'd sort of come in and do the rounds, but he was oblivious, uh, always pretty articulate sort of fellas, so I was able to sort of always put on a good front. That was 2011, I uh, stayed in and out of their houses for probably a couple of years, um, moved on, house sat at a place for about three months. I was drinking every night by then, just at home. And I'd get hammered and just wanted to get out. You know, I'd never had money. I was on Centrelink, so I'd wait till payday and head into the city and just chat to random people and end up uh, just getting wasted either on my own at a pub or with some pretty shady blokes usually. And really surprising I didn't sort of go down the drug path there. I was around so much of it, but because of my mum, um, I was always pretty afraid. And my mum died in 2010, the year that I'd split with the girlfriend and um, sort of just started to reconcile things with her and was sort of developing a new relationship. And her lifestyle of uh, drug abuse and health issues caught up. She had major spinal surgery from a car accident she'd had probably 20 years earlier and caught a nasty infection in the hospital, the staff variety, and um, she was in palliative care for a couple of months and then she died two days before my birthday, my 25th birthday. So it's going back to 2010, um, 2013, 14. Yeah, I was still living. Um, sort of a pretty transient lifestyle or wasn't working. I'd stopped full-time work for over three years, picked up a bit of casual work here or there, cash stuff, menial labouring sort of stuff. Um, and then an opportunity came up with that, the Christian group I was with to move into a, a really novelty house. It was an old fire station. I was the first one to move in there. And, um, yeah, sort of didn't mind it. I had a bit of um, a um, fitness thing going on. I was pretty fit. I was going out, um, having a little bit of success with women, um, not much. And through some mutual friends, I got into a relationship with a girl. Um, only the second one I'd been in, and. We hit it off and went through all the fun honeymoon type stuff. Uh, this is 2014, I was 28. Um, fast forward oh, three, four, five months, I moved in with her. She had a little unit. Um, it was messed up. She had a lot of issues, mental health. Um, it wasn't her fault. Beautiful, beautiful girl. Um, I proposed to her in 2015. We got married a year later. 2016, we moved into a really nice place, a rental. End of 2015, and things were looking pretty good for me. Uh, drinking was pretty messed up. I sort of got into a relationship with her under the pretense I wasn't drinking, and that I was sort of um, under control. And I kept that facade up for a couple of months, and then she. Gave in and sort of accepted that was my lifestyle and we ended up drinking together a hell of a lot. Um, a few months before our marriage in 2016, we'd gone to a, a family party, uh, birthday event. I got hideously drunk and uh, we jumped in an Uber to get home that night and um, I became psychotic. I told her we were going to die. I was going to attack the, the driver and we'd have a fatal car accident kept saying, this is it, this is it, it's going to happen. Didn't do it. Uh, we got home. She ran off, called the police. Um, I was passed out in bed and woke up to a handful of cops in the bedroom and um, they figured out what was going on. I was really lucky that they sort of let me go that night, let me stay in the house. Had an IVO taken out 
by the police uh, against me for my, my almost wife. Um, and she had a psychotic breakdown because of what I put her through. So she was in a psychiatric facility for a month and um, I gave up the drink for about two months. Did a, wasn't working. I did a security course, tried to get myself on the straight and narrow, picked up work in security. Um, the rest of that 2016 year wasn't too bad. I was sort of, I was working a bit, sort of somewhat controlling my drinking. Uh, it didn't last for long. Um, and the security bit um, to <coughs> do for me was a terrible environment. I was doing a lot of night shift work autonomously, um, you know, shopping centres that were closed, staying there from sort of 6P to 6A. And um, I'd just bring a whole heap of bottles of wine with me. I'd, I'd ask to do a, um, a static guard position, usually in the car park where I was on my own. I'd just get blind drunk. And amazingly, I'd sort of be able to sign out and people wouldn't be able to tell. I guess it was over a long enough period that I was able to sort of keep some sort of composure and I'd be you know, swallowing tubes of toothpaste, breath mints, bucket load of aftershave to try and cover it all up um, and one night I got a gig uh, working at a, a gaming room at a pub and um, again I'd bring my bag with me I'd go into the toilet skull a heap of beers come back again didn't seem to get noticed uh, even though it smelled like a brewery and um, got so brazen and so desperate from my drinking I was just going into their cool rooms and, and taking drinks drinking them in the cool room or whatever. Sure enough, they had some CCTV. They found out what I'd done. I got, I got let go. They were going to pursue it with the police. Thank God my supervisor was able to convince them not to. Um, and that was the last security shift I've done. Yeah, um, never got back into it, thank God. Um, end of 2017 was, was it for me. Um, about a week before Christmas, I got blind drunk. Um, wife was in bed, I was at home. I'd always struggled with my mental health. I've got anxiety, disorder, depression, epilepsy, which is alcohol and juice or medication for all of that. Um, and decided that was it. I was going to take my life that night and um, wrote a pathetic suicide note for my wife and went outside absolutely hammered um, I tried to hang myself on a tree thank god the rope was too weak and the tree branch was not strong enough and I sort of woke up half dazed um, my wife obviously figured out what was going on and called an ambulance taken to hospital under police guard it was extremely aggressive and, and verbally abusive towards the cops I kept wanting to get into fights with them and god they were very decent patient men um, Discharge the next day, the wife immediately left. She stayed with my sister, the one I referred to at the beginning of this uh, video. And that was the second last time I've ever seen her. She never spoke to me really, a couple of text messages, Christmas and years went by. She told me I had to get out of our house. Um, in absolute desperation, I went back to this, this Christian group I'd been estranged from for three years. Uh, they put me up. Another IVO got served, 12 month one from the from the wife. Uh, we caught up, had to get some belongings from our house. She said that was it for us and to file for a divorce or separation for 12 months first. Um, that was a mess, I was so lonely. I was, I'd stopped drinking, this is the first few weeks of January. Giving it up, um, it stopped sort of at six months that year up until about June and in the sheer place of loneliness I jumped onto a Christian dating website and sort of hit it off through a heap of heap of phone calls and hours long with a, a girl up in uh, New South Wales say a Victorian living in East Melbourne um, decided to fly up there and meet her for the first time again we hit it off the chemistry was undeniable um, I was living a double life, didn't tell her about the wife that got found out, um, tell her about any of my issues with alcohol, uh, I used to fly back and forth, 
um, throughout March, and April. Um, so it looked like I was pretty serious, and I probably she has a couple of kids. So I was obviously if we're going to make a move. I'd move up there. Um, had some money when I left uh, my my marriage. I had about twenty grand. I uh, wasn't working. I um, was blowing it on all sorts of stupid random stuff. Bought a couple of cars. Uh, anyway, blew it all. I was you know, having zero dollars in my bank by May, and I wasn't drinking. It was blowing on all sorts of crap. Traveling back and forth wasn't cheap. So I sold everything I had. Um, I was painted by trade, but I had a heap of tools. Went to cashiers and sold everything. My phone, iPad, um, all that sort of reasonably pricey sort of stuff and um, I wasn't even drinking so I was, you go to cashiers and sell everything you got it's usually the feeder I have it um, and then in May things just went disastrously wrong I, I was an absolute bloody mess as suicidal as ever more than I had been when I tried to take my life got back on the on the booze I was drinking ridiculous amounts of alcohol a heap of sleeping tablets and things I had from the doctor. One night I thought it would be a good idea to, to go for a drive up in the mountains, uh, a place called um, Sky Heights, I think, the Dandenongs. Couldn't see what I was doing. I ended up swerving off one of the highest parts of the mountain road and went down a, a ditch, slammed into a... No, I was pulled just short of a, a big tree somehow. The car was bogged, didn't have any damage, but was absolutely stuck. About three in the morning, I um, walked up the side of the mountain, got an Uber. How the hell the guy was prepared to pick me up? Got home, woke up hungover and absolutely terrified. Had a car up in the side of a mountain. I Ubered it back up there again. There was police tape everywhere. Um, thought, oh, here we go. I'm stuffed. I'm going to get done by the cops. Called up my girlfriend in central coast New South Wales had no money uh, convinced her to get a tow truck for me cost her 700 bucks the tow trucks won't take a car out of an accident say it's a police issue somehow convinced the driver because there was no damage on the car that I'd actually parked it and the handbrake had uh, failed on me and had just gone down the slope and it had nothing to do with a, a driving misdemeanor he towed me out I drove home that night Cops never ever spoke to me, so I pulled all the tape down before the towie got there and made it look um, innocent enough. Drove home, uh, was smashing my car all the time, pranging it everywhere, backing into friggin' cars, and went through the drive through and drove into a pole at Red Rooster. Um, and my life was a mess. I thought I had the cops after me, I was extremely paranoid, drinking. Um, every dollar and cent that I had and thought I'm going to get out of here I'm going to run so I thought I'll go up the coast in New South Wales now and live with my, my girlfriend who was desperate for me to come up there and um, managed to convince my dad to buy me a ticket for a plane got up there end of May 2018 about 20 bucks in my bank account got back on Senno uh, drip feed me money my girlfriend covered everything she's absolutely amazing woman um, stayed with her for a month and then got back on the on the booze again. Had a wild night out, she didn't know where I was. I got into all these fights at the pub, I was pretty messed up. And next day I thought oh, I've, I've absolutely stuffed it with her. She's um, seen my real me and she was devastated about what I'd done and thought I'm going to get out of here or go back to Melbourne. Flew back and my dad uh, again bought me a ticket, stayed with him for a bit. I knew some wonderful people who were in Melbourne, they were able to put me up in a house, a share house, a couple of really good folks, uh, older guys. Uh, this is in July 2018. And then I had the worst week of my life in July that year. Um, had a full blown psychotic breakdown, um, anxiety attacks that were lasting for 12 hours and I couldn't count to 10. I was dying every second and I was paranoid. I think the cops are going to come. I've done all this stuff. They're going to show up and you know, all this dramatic, go to jail, all this sort of stuff. I was admitted for a psychiatric ward, stayed there for a couple of days. 
just medicated off my eyeballs and uh, when I got out I still had my ute, <laughs> shitty old banged up car, someone had kept it for me while I was in uh, New South Wales. Yeah, drinking again, drink driving like there was no tomorrow and uh, one night I jumped in the, the ute close to midnight, I was hungry so I thought I'd drive to Coles and grab some, some food. Driving back, absolutely hammered. I didn't even know where I was going. I was taking wrong turns and uh, pulled into a dead end. And across the road from the dead end was a main highway, and I saw a cop car. And they see the bloke stuck in a dead end. He doesn't know how to reverse and get out. So a couple of streets later, the, the flashing of the car, they pulled me over. Great guys. It sounds weird. They really were. Two about to station. I blew a smidge over 0.1. Car impounded. Immediate loss of license. Uh, thousands of dollars of fines, court case, all that stuff. And I was absolutely done with life. And the only thing that kept me going was the fact I knew I could get out through suicide. It was a comfort blanket for me. And um, didn't attempt it again. I got back on the cyber journey. And... I completely called it off with a girlfriend and stopped speaking to her, all this stuff. I reached out to her again in desperation and loneliness. Went back up there a few times, sort of through August 2018. And August, I uh, wasn't to know at the time, but uh, I got her pregnant and found out about a month later while still in Melbourne, back and forth, absolute mess. I thought, wow, this is it for me. I've straightened my shit out. So I flew back there again and moved in with her again and um, tried the whole be the father figure to the kids and do it all right. I was there for a few months. Got a, a super annuation payout because I've been on Seno for a while. It's about eight grand or something. And uh, a week after my birthday in December 2018, went off the rails again. Moved out, had an argument, so I, I pissed off, left again. Stayed in the coast for about a week, just drinking, started doing a little bit of drugs, cocaine and stuff like that. Uh, more fighting, more waking up, having no idea what's going on. I was staying at a hotel, I going to go back to Melbourne again. So I did that again, stayed there for a while. And um, here my partner is pregnant with my son and I'm off the rails drinking, drugging and uh, back in Melbourne. Absolute mess. Uh, by this stage it was January... 2019 and um, had my court case for the driving offence, drink driving. That went pretty well. Magistrate was laying out with me, no prize. Um, still living in Melbourne, my, my partner with pregnant with my son, absolutely distraught. I left her there, no support from me, just absolute trauma that I put her through. And late 2018 in January I was in my bedroom drinking at a six or eight pack of VB. I got through my fifth beer. I was so crook, eh? Like my guts were just, I was so crook. It was destroying my body, all this stuff. And I couldn't really get through the rest of the drink. I was so sick. So I put a half, half a can down and thought I'm done for tonight. And that's the last drink I've had. Um, don't know really why, it was a mess, no reason to stop. I was working, got some work, labour work with a couple of really good blokes. Was sort of cracked in and helped them out for a month or so. Got a bit of money behind me. My girlfriend-ish was into her third trimester and I thought I've got to get back up there. I've got to see my son be born and get there for the last bit of appointments and all that stuff. Uh, he was born in May, 2nd of May, my dad's birthday, 2019. After moving up there about four days into my time up there, I got a, a job as a, as a painter with some mutual friends and my, my partner who's teed me up. It was four days work, just doing some basic prep stuff for a painter. Um, I've been with them now for 18 months. Uh, my son was born, amazing experience, most beautiful looking kid, as biased as parents are, absolute miracle of God, so beautiful. Um, still now, he's 
seven, eight months old. I'm a pretty useless father. I don't really know how to be a dad. I've never been modelled very well. Um, the only way I really try to provide with him is buy him lots of toys and trying to have the money there. That's better than nothing, but it's not sufficient. I have moments with him. I, I shower with him every night and I try to play with him and hang out with him when I get home from work. Um, yes, yeah, AA, I've been to it off and on and they talk about your higher power and um, that never clicked with me. And then my son was born and I had this epiphany that he can't choose for me to be sober so I can't choose either I have to be because he doesn't have the choice and that's been my mantra and that's stopped me from picking up a drink um, the guys I work with paint who drink every day probably not the best relationship with alcohol for those guys so I'm around it at least every second day um, it's just fortified my desire to stay sober um, I don't want to drink uh, I really don't. I've had a few struggles where I've sort of wanted to, and I made some wise decisions at the end of last year with Christmas parties and that to not go. Um, I've gone through a fair bit in that time. It hasn't been smooth sailing. I've had terrible arguments with the mother of my child. Stormed off. I've had um, a fair bit of crap go on, mental health breakdowns, but I've never gone back to the drink, and uh, I really hope I don't. Um, it's enabled me to, to work. I think I've had a couple of days off in 18 months. Uh, found a work ethic I didn't know I had. Found a consistency of character I didn't know I had. It's great to go to bed each night and wake up the next morning knowing you haven't done some absolute drunken, stupid act, you know, and you're accountable because you can be and you can be consistent in your character and present well or at least be real every day. And, um, set a good example for my son so far and it's what I have no matter how hard things get or how much I struggle I know my sobriety is is a an armor that I have and that no matter how much I'm struggling if I don't drink I don't go back to those places of despair and um, I've always got something no matter how hard things get I'm not in a relationship with the mother of my child amicable I, I live with her and it's amicable we're good friends um, I do love her I really do I, I'm not with her right now we've had another blue and I'm actually in a, a hotel I've been here for about five days and she probably no doubt thinks I'm back on the piss oh, I'm not um, obviously but get to keep pushing through and finding a way and, and just for me to be sober and, and working and my finances are under control and um, it's bloody smoking, hey, I can't kick that, but otherwise I'd probably be a fair bit healthier too. But um, encourage, encourage everyone to find something, please. I've been hanging from a ledge that some people stand on, to quote a Missy Higgins song, and I've pulled through so far, and I'm, I'm doing my best, and I really hope others can gain something from this reach out to me if you want I'd, I'd love to I try to be real and honest about my alcoholism um, if you stay sober it's the only disease I can think of that the longer you have it the healthier you get um, it's weird but I feel like that's true and I really feel like a potential to be thoroughly good decent people is inevitable in our sobriety and it can be when we're still drinking too it's just it's tainted um, I hate alcohol, I hate what I've done with it, not what it's done to me, what I've done with it and how I've allowed myself to engage with it, that's on me 100%. So, encourage you guys, everyone, to find whatever it is that you feel you need to find the peace, because it's all about peace and contentment, uh, that's what sobriety is about, it's... it's yeah, you minimise the stupid stuff, but it's about the peace. An addictive, an active addiction and peace are, are, are um, polar opposites, and it breaks my heart that others cannot be in a place of peace and are hurting. We hurt others, but we hurt ourselves the most. And um, my life's just been an absolute spiral of mess. But you know, I'm, I'm 35 soon. I, I hope. 
the next part of my life could end tomorrow, could end in 50 years or longer, but is um, is at least one on authenticity, honesty, and sobriety, and um, we've all got that. We could all be such amazing people, we're amazing creatures. We're an absolute testament to some intelligent design that I don't understand, and um, we deserve to love and to be loved. And, it's there for everyone so I just encourage you and I hope well, I don't hope you can relate to my story but if you can I, I hope it gives you some sense of, um, of hope and desire to, to go through the journey it's um, it's really scary but I don't think it's as scary as, as a, an active addiction and just hang in there and be kind to yourself um, we are good people, we do silly things, but we have so much to offer. And um, a life of sobriety allows us to have compassion and empathy for people that a lot of people don't have or aren't able to really experience. And that's a blessing and a gift. And I think we can all use that. So yeah, I hope maybe this has given you guys something and yeah, love to be able to engage with people. That's really what I want to do more than anything. So yeah, thanks for tuning in guys. Cheers.